Sponsor Saturday. It's fucking Monday, dumbass. Ah, yes. Just what the world needed. Another monster summoning simulator, right? Well, hang on. In Monster Legends, you can actually breed your own monsters and create completely new abominations you can torture players online with. Use your newly bred monster to engage in battle with other monster masters and earn trophies, win rewards, and climb the leaderboards and earn the title of, uh, Master... Monster... Master... That, that's not a thing. I, I don't even know if they have a title for something like that. Like, you're just at the top. So if you do that, then congratulations. Monster Legends recently teamed up with The Walking Dead to celebrate this show returning to television, and they created six new monsters inspired by the iconic characters. Taking humans and turning them into monsters for a free-to-play mobile game sounds really uncanny valley-ish on paper, but the design of these monsters are actually really faithful to the characters while still retaining their ghoulish appearance in-game. It's a pretty nice design. Collecting Rick, Carol, Maggie, and Daryl will also allow you to automatically obtain Negan as well, who probably has some of my favorite battle animations in the game. I don't know why, but seeing a dude with a barbed wire bat coexisting with all these eldritch nightmares in this universe is just, it, it, it's an amazing sight to me, like unironically. You can download the game right now using my link in the description, or you can use the QR code displayed at the top right corner of the screen here. Do this and you'll be started off with 100,000 gold, 20,000 food, 3 gems, and the Mothman monster. Thanks again to Monster Legends for sponsoring this video, and uh, I, I don't have an outro. I, I, wow, I can't even write outros for my own sponsors. All right, well, fuck me. Let's just start the video then, I guess. Hey, uh, you guys want to, like, rank the keepsakes later? The hell you mean no? Because this game is six months old and replays are already agonizing for an overwhelming majority of us and making new weapon movesets takes time, okay? No, 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 I get, I get it. You have better things to do. Go, find, go do your taxes or something. Coming in last place for me is the cracked pot. Not that this item actually does anything useful because who gives a shit about crafting anyways, but even if this item was anything remotely close to remarkable, it wouldn't even matter because Kale sells three of them out of the gate for 300 runes apiece. You literally have to walk out of the gate into Limgrave and they're just there. A lot of the good pots that are actually worth crafting aren't even available until you've spent all your free time gathering the best cookbooks from each faction, and I think what's hilarious is that no matter how ass-foamingly atrocious these pots are for anything outside of proccing status effects, anything negative you can say about them only feels half-honest because the same now-empty cracked pot you just flung into some animal's face has magically warped its way up your ass and back into your inventory. So you're not really losing out on anything, I guess? Like, you still get to keep the pots despite them being obliterated, reduced to atoms in the hit animation, very obviously just fragmenting into particles of unsalvageable powder. Nah, just pick that shit back up, man. Put some flex seal on that bitch, it'll be usable in no time. The only time I've ever paid attention to crafting an Elden Ring is when I needed a long-lasting buff that would be worth investing the materials into, or if I forgot to take a shower this morning and needed to lather up, fucking, I don't know. I have, I've never crafted a single pot in my whole life, and if I don't ever see the menu again, I wouldn't lose any sleep over. It. Nice. You practice consumable item runs? Great. Love that for you. Go make a fucking video. In eighth place, the boiled prawn. It isn't going in last only because it isn't an item you can really get until you finish some random asshole's quest that you probably definitely intentionally killed anyways. So the scarcity of this item sort of justifies picking it up here, but only marginally. 15% damage reduction doesn't scale off of your current damage reduction or anything. It's not your inherent defense plus or multiplied by 15%. It's 15% shaved off off of the damage being done to you at any time you're hit. If that didn't sound like it made sense, then just trust me when I say that's much better than the former. It basically just means any enemy that damages you is just hitting for 85% of their normal damage. And as delicious as they look, and admittedly as good as the reduction benefits are, 5 is nowhere near enough to be worth anything. You're either getting these because you want to try and kill the tree sentinel early, or you're just hungry in real life. When you run out, you begin to realize just how much damage certain enemies can really hit for, and if you use up all five and build a dependency for them, you're just going to have to deal with this uncomfortable couple of hours where the game suddenly gets much harder and you just have to adapt. It's an okay item, but there are better damage negation tools out there, and once you use them up, any hope of getting them again is very annoyingly out of the way. Also, it's a, it's a, it's a crayfish, it's not a prawn. The description says this and in the same breath tells you it doesn't matter, so why not just call them boiled crayfish? Like, that, that's not a stupid question to have, right? In seventh place is the Lands Between rune. It's like checking your bank account and finding out someone put $30 in it. You're pleasantly surprised, but you can't really do much with it. So, 
Enjoy your money, I guess. I'm giving six plates to Shabriri's Woe. The description is slightly misleading because despite saying it attracts enemies' aggression, it's only ever useful when actually playing in co-op mode. Shabriri's Woe can basically allow you to play as the tank of the group while you let your homies do most of the damage. They'll encounter significantly less resistance just because the talisman will force almost any enemy to tunnel vision on your ass and give you all the attention. It's niche, and it's definitely not useful in any situation simply because you're already restricted to certain locations to having co-op anyway, but it's an interesting item that opens up a really interesting way to play the game. It's a really fun way to enter fights with really low levels, and it can open a bit of room for possible build synergies between you and a couple friends in the game, because since you'll be attracting most of the aggression, you would ideally want to have the tankiest abilities and the heaviest armor and the biggest red bar. Sadly it doesn't work in single player, no, not even with summons, but if you're the host, then you'll likely be the one wearing it to compensate for your lackeys and their distinct lacking of HP. So if you're the host, getting the majority of the aggro is a massive help, and doubly so if it looks like your friends are trying to play the game with a steering wheel. It's a fun item, but the fact that it only works in co-op means there's an extremely small list of reasons to ever use it if you're doing literally anything else. Coming in fifth place is the Crimson Amber Medallion. It's as mediocre as you expect it to be, just because there are better talismans the game wants you to pick up during the playthrough, but because it's percentage-based, it remains surprisingly helpful, even in the end game, because it doesn't have the drawback of being soft capped once you reach a predetermined vigor level. It's probably one of the best items you can select, but I don't think that equates to being a great keepsake, because once again, you can just kill a few mobs and earn 1500 runes so you can buy it off the merchant towards the entrance of Weeping Peninsula. Once again, that's that shit'll take you like five minutes. You're honestly better off just getting the lands between rune and going and getting the talisman from the merchant instead of selecting it here. But that's also assuming you don't want to use the runes to buy upgrade materials or something like that. But honestly, if we're taking the actual function of the talisman into mind, then it doesn't even matter where you get it, because a measly 6% HP boost isn't all that helpful in the early game. If you're selecting this, it's more because you plan on receiving much better benefits in the end game by stacking it with other health talismans and finally figuring out if that health bar can actually extend off the right side of the screen, just because you're curious. The golden seed is coming in fourth. Free health upgrade, why the fuck not? Except for the fact that it literally takes you maybe three minutes at most to haul your ass to the gatefront grace, get your Honda Accord, and ride out past the gatefront enemies and just pick up the seed that's already there. A flask upgrade is a powerful item, don't get me wrong, but there are a few reasons to justify selecting a keepsake that doesn't require some huge time commitment to obtain in-game. If it were a sacred tier, maybe my opinions would be slightly different because they're a little more out of the way, but even then, once you earn your trusty steed, the furthest areas in Limgrave will only take you like five or so minutes to reach. So the only reason I can see this working as a good selection would be if you wanted to have two golden seeds at the start, allocate your cerulean flask over to the dark side so you have six crimson flasks in total, which I'd imagine makes the market fight a lot easier to take care of without leveling or upgrading in any way. And that's one hell of an olive branch. Yeah, we're on number four, and I still have more bad things than good things to say about these items. That's how you know we're really in bad shape. Oh wow, bewitching branch near the top. Big fucking surprise, right? Going by my own logic, the bewitching branches are some of the most unavailable items you can find in Elden Ring. You can get three in the Weeping Peninsula, but the keepsake selection gives you five. But once you've used these things in pretty much any duo fight, you'll understand immediately why they're all the rage, and five just won't be enough for you. This also has a pretty dark lore implication here that explains a lot about how Mikola had so many followers in his heyday. People weren't just willfully bowing and worshipping whoever they wanted. No, my brother in Christ, that's mind control. They work on a lot of regular enemies that you normally want leaving you alone anyways, like the prawns and the rune bears, and they can work on banished knights, which make them a real treat to have during the fight with Nile. The only reason I'm not putting these at the tippity tippy top is because it took me a lot more trouble than I thought to actually find instances where these would, you know work. Most of the times they didn't, and it turned out to be against bosses that later showed up as regular enemies, such as the Crystallians, Faramazula Beastmen, and Watchdogs, and oh right, 90% of the fucking bosses to begin with. That's always given me a good chuckle, because that's probably a sign that Mikola vastly overestimated the average intelligence of the life roaming around the lands between. Sadly, most of these dudes are just truly too stupid to be influenced. It's like a virus trying to infect your PC, only your setup is so old that even the virus looks at your system and goes, what the 
this shit is that? I didn't know they made motherboards out of tape and rocks. I ain't going near that shit. These also become extremely coveted items mid-game just because of how rare the crafting materials really are. You can't even reliably make them yourself until you've made some good headway in Landell, and even then Mikola's lilies are pretty sparse. Also, they last for three minutes. Coming in second place, the Feigned Imp Ashes. These little guys almost made it into my underrated Spirit Ashes video. Although not being a desired pick when you're finding ashes like Lutel and Rollo and Tish and all that, it's still a massively underrated pick, and I think that's because you're either playing the game for the first time and have no idea how summoning even works, or people just assume it's shit because it's a summon that's available from the jump. These guys are pretty insane. If they're this goddamn annoying in all the caves and dungeons, imagine how annoying they are to your enemies. The Fang Dimps are also canonically dating? I guess? I don't know. Apparently that's how a lot of people have interpreted this item description, which I guess kind of makes a lot of sense considering they seem to actually attack with a bit of strategy and communication instead of just poking at everything that moves with their little kitchen tongs. The only drawback I can really think of is their low HP that really doesn't serve them well in later areas. And they're also really small, making them practically useless against anything bigger than you. But the frequency at which they attack combined with their high bleed buildup makes them a good choice in a surprisingly high amount of situations. Don't sleep on these guys guys just because the game gives them to you as the keepsake, like they're actually good. Stone sword keys are one of those items that only end up being good if you've played the game enough times to know where all the spots are and know everything they unlock. So why in Godfrey's golden ass are they all the way up here? Well, hear me out. Stone sword keys are hard enough to come by, which is made all the more significant by the fact that the game gives you two of these fuckers as a keepsake. If you hate your life and want to immediately unlock the fringe folk hero's grave, then this item gives you direct access to everything in the tomb as soon as you start the game, which is actually a great thing, because this tomb has some of the best items that are invaluable to players looking for a good head start on everything the game has to offer. And no, I didn't say anything about fighting the boss. By itself, this keepsake isn't particularly outstanding, but the fact that it allows you to unlock the very first hero's grave area right from the beginning and gives you access to the buffet of sweet items inside I don't think should be ignored. For this reason, I'm putting this one in my personal first place. The game isn't just giving you a couple of keys, it's giving you fringe folk. Fringe folk is your keepsake. Spirit summon, dragon communion seal, Urtree's favor, a big ass bow, some weapon buffs, and a fucking golden seed. Oh, and and you can also find another stone sword key in here. Likely because a lot of people would have felt shorted if they selected two stone sword keys as a keepsake without being told the very first place they can use them consumes both. Considering you're still walking out of here with the stone sword key, I'd consider that a huge net gain. Not a really exciting item later on. Most times it just feels like you're slapping a quarter into an arcade machine and fighting some shitty boss you've seen for the seventh time. In fact, this is the only hero's grave that needs to be unlocked with stone sword keys. So to me, selecting this key Keepsake is definitely a winner. Oh, and once again, here's that QR code to get you started. Thanks again to Monster Legends for helping me pay my college loans, because I definitely said the word fuck within like the first two seconds of this video, so God knows I'm not getting any ads on this one.